in a world where retro computing reignites the passion of nostalgic gamers. The Amiga, a titan of vintage technology. A new challenge emerges. Join us on an epic journey to create a ROM switcher. This is not just an upgrade. <coughs> that is not doing anything at all for my voice. So, I kind of went on a journey. I wanted to do a very simplistic ROM switcher. I wanted something that was pretty much entirely passive to allow me to switch ROMs. The other issue, if you know Amigas, is that not all of them were made equal. The early revisions have a hardware bug. The ROM socket is not quite wired up correctly. Address 17 is wired up to where the byte select pin should be. Pin 1, which is actually address 17, is connected to nothing. If you look at the pinout of the 27C400, which is there to mimic the same mask ROMs that the Amiga uses, you can see why they might have made that mistake. You can see how somebody would think that pin 31 would obviously be address 17. This doesn't cause a problem with Kickstart 1.3, because the ROM is actually small enough that it doesn't require address line 17 at all. So this wasn't a problem in the early release Amigas, but it is a problem if you want to go to a later version of Kickstart. Those are bigger ROM images and you do in fact need that address line 17 to be connected. So can I build a ROM switcher that's entirely passive and is compatible with all the 68K Amigas that had an OCS or ECS chipset? So that's the A500, 600s, 2000s, CDTV, so on. And I want it to be able to switch between at least two ROM images. And that's where this prototype first came about. I've chosen to start this with a 27C800, which gives me the potential for two ROM images. Now here's my original prototype. This is definitely putting the hack in Hack Build Restore. This works functionally and allows me to switch between two different images on a 27C800. I did toy with the idea of putting some LEDs to tell me which way it was switched, but that didn't really work out. The feature that's missing from this that I will need in the final version is that ability to correct for the early revision Amigas, where the ROM socket is wired up not quite right. If I can correct that in the switcher, that means I've got something that's truly universal. So having used my crude prototype to prove the theory, I moved on to creating something a little more elegant, adding the functionality that I thought would definitely fix the problem with the early revision Amigas. On building the first iteration of this ROM switcher, I found that when it was set in the early revision mode, i.e. Rev 5 and below, the byte mode select line was actually left floating, which isn't entirely useful because that does need to be high to put it into 16-bit word mode, which is what the Amiga runs by default. By adding a bodge wire to this, which basically just ties that pin on the EPROM directly to VCC, that solves the problem and the switcher works perfectly. So the first revision of the board went okay. Bodge wire on the back, so not ideal. Definitely not something that I could uh, release into the wild. The second revision, however, that came very close after that, that corrects that fault, I've also extended it to allow you to use a 27C160, which will allow up to four ROM images to be switched between on the single switcher. These ROMs are relatively easy to come by, as long as you go for ones that are no slower than 100 nanosecond, so that's the Dash 100, they will work fine in Amiga. Or that's my experience so far. So when building the ROM switcher, it makes easiest building to build yourself a little keep first. Essentially we're using a 40 pin socket as a jig. This allows us to get the pins lined up before we put the PCB on. It can sit in there while we solder it up and there, then you know it's going to fit in a socket perfectly.
When adding the 42 pin socket to the upper side, you just need to make sure it's pushed down really properly so that it's not sticking up at one side. It's maybe not the perfect design, you can clip some of the pins off down one side if you find it doesn't quite fit. I did see a video from Kari, who's a 19 year old YouTuber who's doing fantastic, much better than I am. And her solution to this is to use a breadboard to stick the pins in first and then solder the board. Kind of genius and I don't understand why I never thought of it. I probably will never do it because I can never find my breadboard. Sponsors of this video are PCBWay. They provide PCB prototype fabrication from as little as $5. They also have a huge library of shared projects, and if you're not confident with a soldering iron, you can get them to assemble them for you. PCBWay also have CNC machining and 3D printing services. All of this is available at PCBWay.com. Thanks PCBWay for sponsoring this video. And this gives you a, a simple switch for RIV 5, RIV 6 operation. And I've added the ability to have a 27C 160 here, which then allows four ROMs to be on this single ROM. And you've got a dress line 18 and 19, which are jumperable. Or you can put switches on those. And that allows you to switch between the four different ROMs that are held on here. This board works perfectly but it's missing a feature that I actually quite liked that I came across accidentally with my broken revision one board. I did do some experiments with the adapter in the ROM programmer and it allows you to read the ROM images back fine, but you can't write anything through the switcher. Now, initially this was functionality that did exist on my first revision and that was down to using the byte pin because byte is also the programming voltage. So on the new revision where that's tied directly to VCC, that's basically going to try and put 12 volts straight into VCC, which isn't going to work very well. So let's not do that. It didn't break anything when I did, but let's, let's pretend I didn't do that. That allows you to use a switcher to program each of the images individually as if this was actually a 27C400. So let's see if we can actually build that function in intentionally, which makes it a lot easier to get ROM images onto the ROM because you don't have to start joining them together or leveraging the features in your ROM writing software that allows you to load things at different offsets. Because that can really get quite tedious and confusing and I'm still not quite sure which ROM image is going to be where. Being able to put the jumpers to where I want them to be and then write specifically the image I want in that position makes it a lot simpler. So now revision free, let's build one of those. This should be the final version of this ROM switcher. It can fix the Rev5, it can fix the problem for the early revision Amigas, you can write the ROM images by switching it to write mode, and that allows you to write the images individually. You don't even have to write them at the same time. You could write one image to the EPROM, and then six months later, write another image when you've decided what you want the switch to be. And that's because the way the ROMs work is when they're blank, all the cells are high, and when you write them, you pull them low. So they'll stay high for as long as you want. And it does not nothing to say that you can you have to write the whole ROM at once. I mean, let's face it, when it's writing the ROM, it's writing it one cell at a time.
Well, I've managed to get the ROM switcher built and functioning and I've written ROM images to it. So let's test it in the Amiga. So when I need a switcher, it's during diagnostics. And that's mainly to avoid that mechanical wear, taking a ROM out of a socket and putting a different ROM in continually to switch between maybe diagram and a kickstart. But that's not this journey quite complete. At Kickstart 2 Expo, I got talking to Chris Cathers. He's got some ROMs that you can write directly using the TL-866. That's significant because I have to use this crazy adapter to write ROMs. And they're not necessarily that cheap. They're relatively simplistic, but I suppose I could build one myself. But if you've just got the ROM writer, you can write to a 27C4096 without any adapter at all. And that's the same capacity or size as a 27C400. But their pinouts are vastly different. The 27C400 is, to a logical human being, pretty crazy, whereas the 27C4096 is a fairly linear layout where all the address pins are grouped together in a kind of sequential way, which makes a lot more sense. Same with the data pins in a very sequential way. So I said, well, send me one of the ROMs and I'll make you an adapter. He did, along with an Amiga 1200 case that's kind of a bit banana coloured, but we'll have a fix for that in another video. Thank you very much, Chris, for sending these. So I got to work building an adapter. So the first pass at that adapter allows you to use a 27C4096 in an Amiga. Shall we test one of them? So before building an adapter, I did some searches online. This must be something that somebody else has already built. Well, it turns out, no. All the adapters, when you search for 27C4096, are the ones to allow you to write 27C400s in the ROM programmer. But that's the wrong way around. Why hasn't anybody built one that allows you to use these reasonably easy to get hold of EPROMs in an Amiga? So I set about designing one and getting it made, and here it is. So I'm glad to say that this worked absolutely perfectly first time, which is actually unusual for me. I usually tend to make at least one mistake. So in the tradition of my channel, we're going to do another one anyway and put the Rev5 functionality on the board as well, because that really is going to be useful. So the final revision of this board will be available on PCBWay projects.
So, uh, why not try this video out next?